Hi! Hey, welcome to The Cordial Catholic, a podcast for non-Catholics, new Catholics, and those looking to dig deeper into the Catholic faith. I'm K. Albert Little, an evangelical convert to Catholicism, and this podcast is really born out of one particular idea. It began for me when a Protestant pastor I was working for asked me the question, what's more important, the Bible or tradition? That question led me on a deep dive into the history of my faith, the history of the Bible, the the canon of the Bible, the history of the church, the Reformation, and up to today. As I began digging into the, the history of my faith and those topics, I encountered the Catholic Church. It looms large in church history, and there it was, and all its strange splendor and, con- and confusion and, and all those different things that I believed about Catholicism. And well, this is what happened. I began to read about Catholic theology from actual Catholics. I began to understand that what I thought Catholics believed was based in large part on misinformation and more often than not on simple misunderstandings. Well, this show serves to fill in that same gap. The gap between what you think Catholics believe and what we actually do. Each week I have a real Catholic conversation with a real Catholic thinker from the heart of the Catholic Church. No misinformation here. And this week, I am joined once again by Father Jeffrey Kirby to talk about how to die to yourself, the idea of ascetical theology, what that means, what this Catholic practice is all about, the ins and outs of of grace and sanctification and the original sin and the fall, and how understanding our place in the story of our salvation helps us to understand how to live as a Catholic. It's truly a deeply enriching conversation from one of my favorite guests to have on the this show. You may remember Father Kirby from his appearance talking about suffering back in episode 140. Very popular, lots of fantastic feedback. Well, this is no different. A fantastic, really deep conversation on how to die to yourself. It's a great one. This conversation and all others on this show are brought to you by our patrons at patreon.com slash cordial catholic and our one-time donors at paypal.me slash cordial catholic. And this week, I have a brand new patron to thank for their support of the show. Thank you, Brandon, for your support of the show over at Patreon. And if you are considering supporting this show, if you want to help this thing to keep on going and growing week after week, please do consider prayerfully supporting the show in either of those means. Those links are are in the show notes, and that is deeply appreciated, my friends. Thank you. And now, without any further ado, my conversation with Father Jeffrey Kirby, it's a good one on how to die to yourself. Please listen and enjoy. Hey friends, welcome back to the show. Thanks for being here. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. If you're listening on podcasts, thank you. Please leave a rating and review if you listen on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts. And you can also watch the show on YouTube at youtube.com slash The Cordial Catholic. If you're there, please hit the bell to get notified when episodes come out. And please do subscribe to the channel as well. This week, I am rejoined by a popular guest on this program. I'm talking about Father Jeffrey Kirby. He is the pastor of Our Lady of Grace Parish in Indian Land, South Carolina. He's a moral theologian, a papal missionary of mercy, an adjunct professor of theology at Belmont Abbey College, a speaker, and the author of a number of fine books, including a few we've had on this show before to talk about, including A Manual of Suffering, back in episode 140. 40, you joined us to talk about that book, and our conversation today is focusing around glory unto glory, a primer on ascetical theology. Uh, Father Kirby, I almost said Dr. Kirby, <laughs> we're, we're close. Father Kirby, welcome back to the show. Thank you for being here, and hello. Yeah, it's good to be back on the show. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> I want to say I am thrilled to have you back because we talked about suffering last time, episode 140, and I'll link to that in the show notes. And, you know, it's not a, a fun, like, exciting topic to talk about necessarily, because it's suffering. But I had incredible feedback from your appearance on the show. People loved the episode, loved the discussion, and really resonated with that with that topic and your presentation of it. So I want to thank you for that book, The Manual of Suffering, and thank you for your uh, our discussion on that topic, Father. It, it was 
Uh, I enjoyed it, and listeners also seem to really enjoy hearing that. So thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. And I'll tell you, whenever I hear things like that, I'm reminded of the parable the Lord tells about the wise virgins who use their oil well and who were prepared. I think the best thing we can do as Christians is to arm ourselves with sacred truth because suffering is going to happen in a fallen world. And, and when we're in the midst of suffering, it's the hardest time to learn. But when we know the answers, then when they're suffering, at least we have something to wrestle with yeah. as we're trying to understand God's providence in the midst of suffering. So I, I'm overjoyed to hear that there was a, a, a response, a, a popular response to, to our conversation because yeah, I just think it's part of the readiness we're called to have as Christians. So, so great. You've made my week. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's, not to belabor the point, but I think that's a fantastic way of putting it, Father, the readiness. Uh, I don't mean to belittle your book on suffering, but I read a giant book on suffering, Ellen, Dr. Eleanor Stump's book, Wandering in Darkness. I'm sure you've maybe heard of it. It's a fantastic treatment. It's about 900 pages long, so, so it, it's a big one. But I read that a while back, a few years ago when it first came out, and I got to say, like, I mentioned this a lot in conversations about suffering, but that book, more than any other book that I, that I had read up to that point, had prepared me for, in my, impacted my, my spiritual life as much as that book did, because that book was the ins and outs of suffering in, gr- in great detail, like 900 pages from, mm. a, from a really prominent Catholic theologian, and that prepared me to suffer in a way that so many other spiritual books hadn't before when I yes. read that. So you're absolutely right, Father. These these kinds of things, and your your manual of suffering uh, is exactly intended to do that. I think you say that in, in the intro of the book, right? The, that, that preparation, that readiness, as you underscore, I think it's, it's seriously, that's life, that's, that's life changing for your, for your yeah. spiritual life, right? When you are ready to encounter that, and then you do encounter it, and you go, oh yeah, I know how to approach this. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And, and, and it's, it's hard enough just, you know, having the suffering and, and, and the answers that we then have to wrestle with. But imagine being in the midst of suffering and, and we don't have the answers yeah. or the truth hasn't been presented to us in, in a credible or convincing way. Then, then the darkness seems almost overwhelming. And it's hard enough, again, when we have the answers. So, again, that, that readiness. And I, I think we have some great spiritual masterpieces. Um, you know, the, the book you reference is, is one that's highlighted oftentimes. And then masterpieces from spiritual saints and mystics that help us understand like, this, this suffering. What are we supposed to do with it? Why does God permit this in the midst of his, his divine providence? And we have answers. <laughs> this is what we're, we are children, not orphans. So God has given us answers so we can be ready. We can be, as St. Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians, we can be armed with that armor of God that, that we're going to need in order to you know, combat the darkness, the fallenness of the world, and, and, and so cooperate with grace and be made ready for eternity. So this, this is... Uh, yeah, I, I'm again just overjoyed by the conversation. Uh, I love when Christians take our, our faith seriously and we understand what we've been given, these life-saving truths um, to help us understand the difficulties of life and how we're supposed to grow uh, in grace. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, Father. We're going to get back into suffering and go for another hour on that by accident if we don't stop here. You're absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely right. I, okay, so our, our topic tonight is ascetical theology. And I want to begin there because it's, the funny thing is, as I was typing notes for this discussion and, I, and reading your book and typing notes along things to ask you, uh, Google insisted that this was not a word. I was making it up. It kept underlining it and trying to autocorrect it into all kinds of different things. So uh, obviously this is a thing that Google needs to learn a bit about. But I think probably because the word is not maybe so common, I think we we all need maybe a refresher on what we're talking about here. So maybe let's begin at the beginning. What do we mean by ascetical theology? Like let, let's, let's kind of start there at the ground floor if we can. Yes, yes. In fact, uh, I'll tell you just to, to, to show you the, the battle and, the, and sometimes the, the struggle to understand the word, uh, there was a, a conversation in terms of the subtitle of the book because it says a primer on ascetical theology. And there was a real debate that should that be changed to an introduction to spiritual theology? Because oftentimes that might resonate with people. And, and, and honestly, the conversation went back and forth. And, and ultimately, I, I said, that I really want us to keep our words, our language. And I think we need to keep this word aesthetic with theology for, for the reasons you just mentioned. We're, we're forgetting our own words. And, and I think that aesthetic theology is, is different than spiritual theology. Sometimes it's popularly, they're properly seen as synonyms. But spiritual theology really is more my experience. It's, it's very subjective. 
So my experience of God, my experience of, of the spiritual life and so on, ascetical theology says, okay, that's cute, but now, now here's what God has revealed, and here's what you now have to accept, and these are the truths that are going to change your life. And in order for them to change your life, you're going to have to die to yourself. So ascesis, the word from which we get ascetical, it really basically means a kind of self-denial or self-death, that I died to myself. Because spiritual theology isn't about the warm fuzzies, or it's not even about the emotional response. In fact, the spiritual masters tell us we are growing the most when we don't have the warm fuzzies or or, or those warm feelings that we also enjoy. But actually, it, it's in that purgative way. We're in that kind of spiritual darkness in which we keep saying, I will be here. I will pray, even though I feel nothing. I get nothing out of it. I think, I feel, but I'm showing up because I love God, that purgation, that self-death. That death ultimately of, of, of our self-love, our egoism. So I really wanted us to keep that word, you know, ascetical theology, because ascetical theology is, is the study of that self-death. What does it mean that we acknowledge that the all-powerful, ever-living God has revealed himself to us, has taught us, and now in our fallenness and our selfishness, we have to die to ourselves in order to cooperate with these revelations and the grace that comes from them in order to be made more like God, to grow glory unto glory. And of course, it's, it's a quote from the scriptures, uh, the, the main title of the book. So ascetical theology is essential, and, and certainly spiritual theology can address this, but I, I'm a real stickler for, we have our words, our language for a reason. We're a people, we have our own traditions, we have our own language, and, and let's make sure we don't forget our words and we highlight the words within our own tradition. Uh, I think that's fantastic. Good answer, Father. So I'm, I'm thinking of, as you say these things, I'm thinking of my faith journey is out of evangelical Christianity. Well, listeners to this show are, are, are looking at the Catholic faith from the outside in some cases, or are new Catholics in many cases. And I'm thinking, you know, a lot of the books that we that we read, the popular books in evangelical Christianity, would be these kind of spiritual theology kind of books, the more like how-to type nuts and bolts here follow these steps and and you'll experience you know the the fullness of Christ right it was those kind of step by step guides versus this approach which i think is more well here's how god wants this to be done you sub, you kind of submit to this die to yourself and do this mm-hmm. versus a step by step kind of almost like a self help type the type mm-hmm. book this seems to be in the in the, the 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 true Catholic spirit, the true the true tradition of of the Catholic Church, yes. a different approach Absolutely. than that, right? Yes, and and, and kind of that self help mentality that you're describing, uh, we find that also in, in Catholic spiritual writing as well. Uh, perhaps influenced by the evangelical tradition, right. or or just our fallen secular society that, that always wants to turn spiritual things into pseudo material things, or that the goal ultimately is that I just feel happy with myself. And so what is the self-help or the steps that, that, that will get me there? And, and my spiritual life is just one part of all of these different pieces that have to come together, and so on, and so on, and so on. But ascetical theology, and, and, and my book will argue, well, wait a minute, what if Jesus actually meant exactly what he said? And, and, and that means that we have to actually die to ourselves, deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow him. So, so my question would be in these other spiritual writings that we find in, in the evangelical and, and Catholic traditions, where's the cross? Where's the cross? Like, because I can voluntarily sacrifice, and there's still a certain control. But when I surrender to ascetical theology and to the cross of Jesus Christ, all my voluntary sacrifices, I realize are preparing me for the involuntary sacrifices that are going to come. So by living a life of, of asceticism, then when cancer hits— or heart disease, or uh, betrayal in relationship, or economic hardship, the involuntary sacrifices that are going to happen in a fallen world, I'm prepared. I don't feel betrayed. No, 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 I've created the perfect me with my self-help. This wasn't supposed to happen. Well, because you've been living in a bubble thinking that the whole world revolves around you. (laughs) I mean, it's ultimately, in some cases, a celebration of narcissism. And, And I would say the gospel breaks through all of that, uh, authentic ascetical theology helps us to understand what does it mean that the Lord Jesus has said to us that we have to die to ourselves. And let, let's just put this in historical context, that when the Lord said that to the initial listeners, the cross was an instrument of intimidation 
by an occupying, unbelieving power. It scared the Hades out of people. The idea of the cross, right? I mean, Roman citizens were not allowed to be crucified by Roman law because it was so horrific. And Jesus is saying to his disciples and to those who are listening to him, if you want to follow me, you have to be willing to take up your cross. It sounded like crazy talk right, <laughs> to the initial listeners. And, and I think that we have forgotten the craziness of that talk in the midst of a fallen world. But what if the Lord actually meant that, that if we're really going to follow him, that we must be willing to take up our cross, we, we must be willing to, to truly die to ourselves. And, and I think the medical theology can help us with that. Yeah, I think that's brilliant, Father. And you mentioned, too, the idea of the voluntary suffering or the voluntary kind of giving of something great. And I think of one thing that Catholics are often accused of by those looking at us from the outside is that we do these ritualized things. We pray the rosary. We you know do a certain number of Hail Marys or Our Fathers or these kinds of things that are very, from the outside, look very ritualistic. And I think they can become that for us, right? So we can we we can feel like, okay, if I'm praying the rosary every day, if I'm doing this thing every day, or going to Mass every day, or going to Mass every Sunday at least, I'm doing what, what God calls me to do, and that is kind of enough. But that's not, as you say, dying dying to yourself, right? That's putting up parameters around what you're going to do for, for God, these voluntary small crosses we might bear. That's maybe a beginning to be Catholic, right. but that's not going to be the same thing as dying to your to yourself, right? Right, right. exactly right. And, and and certainly like when we have these uh, set prayers, uh, of course when we're praying them, we have to put our heart to, into them. And, and the ideal is that they then become a springboard yeah. to spontaneous prayer. But the reason why the Lord Jesus gave us the Lord's Prayer was not simply to memorize it and then to say this set prayer all the time, not solely, but rather to have that prayer and then to use it as a template in order to know how we should be praying spontaneously and how ultimately we're supposed to be living. So even in, in the set prayer of the Lord that he, that he gave to us, we see this type of uh, call to deeper prayer. So, so in one sense, yes, like we, we need to set prayers, but then our heart's supposed to be in them. They should never become empty. And it should also be a, a constant challenge to, okay, now where's my heart? Like, let me cry to him from the depths of my heart. Let me continue to speak to the Lord. I will say on the other side is that those set prayers are very important because when the bottom falls out yeah. in the fallen world and suddenly no one knows where to turn and their heart is so broken or, or so heavy that they feel they can't pray, then it is those set prayers that will hold us within that covenant, that bond with God. So those set prayers have a place. I mean, our, our greatest mystics describe the time of great purgation, great spiritual darkness in which it was the set prayers and the spiritual reading that they did that kept them within that union with God. So, so they have their place, but again, they should never be set by themselves. Right? If we're in a part where we just can't pray, well, then they're going to hold us. Okay, great. But then other places, those set prayers should, should be a challenge to us. Again, that kind of springboard to continue to pray from our hearts. Yeah, <laughs> well, well said. Okay, you talk about the importance, and the kind, this kind of frames the, the book for us, for the reader, the importance of knowing our beginning and our end, or our creation, our finality. And you talk about this as being kind of the, the task of our lives, to, to know that. So I want to begin here. Why is it so important to know our beginning and our end as we live as Catholics? Yeah, so, so, so if we don't know where we've come from or where we're called to go, then we are aimless. Like, what, what, what is the point? Like, and, and ultimately, what, what's tragic is, in a fallen world with fallen hearts, in that aimlessness, we begin to think that we are called to simply live for ourselves. So I begin to live solely because, or, or for my pleasure, or or my uh, subjective satisfaction, and so on, because I don't know that I have a beginning, and I don't know what the goal is, what I'm being called to, so that I begin to solely live for myself. And, and we see that secularism thrives in that arena. It, 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 it relies on that aimlessness in order to steal the hearts of the children of God and convince them that this life is all about them. And the purpose of this life is that they have the most pleasurable, enjoyable, uh, subjectively satisfying life possible. And we know, of course, that's the recipe for, for our misery. Right? You know, it's, it, it, that, that uh, aimlessness leads to meaninglessness. It's something, nothing has value or purpose. We begin to have just the richness of life is, is just stripped from everything. 
because we don't know why it's been given to us or for what purpose or where we're supposed to be going with it. So in Glory Unto Glory, I, I argue that we have to know that horizon of where we've come and where we're going. So then we know why we're here. Like why, why do I exist? Why have I been given these powers of intellect and, and, and will? Why do I have the power to remember and to imagine? Why do I have the capacity to love? <laughs> That's powerful, right? So by knowing our beginning and our end, we can place them within context. I, I like St. Thomas Aquinas. He, he argues that you know the end does not justify the means, but the end orders the means, right? So if I know where I'm going, it determines everything else. So if I'm going on a journey, and I know, hey, I'm going to Austin, Texas, then I know exactly how I have to you know, make the, the, the route and how to uh, chart things out in order to get to Austin, Texas. Everything is about getting to that goal. Well, if I know that my goal in life is to get to eternity, to be with God, it orders everything else. So again, by knowing our beginning and our end, we find a purpose. There is no aimlessness. And by extension, there is no meaninglessness. So I have meaning and purpose. I know exactly why I've been put here. And I know what my goal is. I know I have to, or how I have to order my life and use these gifts, these spiritual gifts, in order to get there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you begin with the beginning, and one of the things you mentioned in in this book that for me was like, yes, Father, yes, say more about this, was talking about our original nature and how this is something that you mentioned a story, uh, a kind of story of, I think, seminary where this kind of came up in, in a discussion with a much wiser and older theologian. But the idea of of our original nature and how and how that works in, in the beginning, what God intended for us, and how that's kind of not really talked about a lot anymore. I, I read that and I went, yeah, Father. I mean, I've heard so many times uh, taught, I don't, I don't want to single out priests, but taught from the pulpit, this idea of belittling that idea of original nature, not understanding that fully, and in all, in all kinds of different lectures and, and, and books and interviews and treatments, this is something, as, as you point out, that I, that I really think needs to be properly underscored again and maybe isn't very often these days. Can you unpack for us then what that is? Or original nature as God intended, and I want to get into the, the fall as well, but maybe start at the, at the, the, the beginning yes, more, yes. And, we'll, and we'll unpack that because I think it's so important if we're talking about our beginning to understand, well, our beginning. Yes, yes. And just to show you how important this is and, and for all of us to, to, to fully grasp uh, why we need to know this original inheritance, the Catechism of the Catholic Church tells us that everything Jesus said, did, and suffered was to restore to humanity its original vocation. So we don't know what the original vocation is. We don't know what Jesus was seeking to accomplish, right? <laughs> and we use these words, redeemed, that the Lord has brought redemption. Well, what has he redeemed? What, what was before that is being redeemed, right, or being restored, right? So oftentimes we can use the language that, that begs more questions, and yet we've gotten so used to this original inheritance not being spoken of that we've just gotten used to the language and, and we don't realize, wait a minute, this really does beg another question. So we go to the original inheritance, and, and something just as simple as the realization that the world in which we live in, this fallen world, is not the world that God wanted for us, right? So just that awareness, like we look at the suffering and the difficulty and the hardship and, and the brokenness of the world and just, you know, sometimes we can say, why does God permit this? Oh, wait a minute, back up. This is not the world God wanted for us. So we go back to the original inheritance of before the fall. What do we see? Like we see that God walked with us in the breeze of the evening. Like that's, that's a very Mediterranean imagery of walking with someone in the breeze of the evening. That's family time. So that's after the evening meal. That's when you're, you're taking this, this walk, this stroll with family. And, and God walked with our first parents. He walked with humanity in the breeze of the evening. There was this closeness, this fellowship, this, this family. You know, Adam and Eve were his sons, his son and his daughter. And, and humanity were his children. And, and he gave us these great gifts, what are called the, the preternatural gifts. So these are extra gifts given to our human nature. So infused knowledge. We would know the things of God and the things that we would need to know. So God tells our first parents who take care of the garden. Boom, they know how to garden. They know how to take care of the trees and the birds and the animals and so on, right? Immediately. There was a harmony within uh, the human soul between our reason and our passions. So our first parents actually had to fight to sin, right? We have to fight to have virtue, 
they actually had to fight to commit sin, right? So there was this inner harmony. And then, of course, our bodies shared in the incorruptibility of our souls. That means we were never supposed to get sick, and we were never supposed to die. Incidentally, we see these all fulfilled in the life of Mary of Nazareth. When we celebrate the Assumption, this is what we're celebrating, that she never suffered death, that at the end of her earthly life, body and soul were assumed into paradise. That was supposed to be our inheritance. So these preternatural gifts were given with sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace is that, that family relationship with God where we truly are his sons and daughters. And our first parents had these. Our, our human nature had these gifts. That's the world and the relationship God wanted with us. And that's the original inheritance. We speak about our human nature. Let me just give you an example in popular jargon. When someone commits a, a sin or there's some great disappointment, we'll hear people say, well, they're only human. Now, I, I'm on one of these like, you know, personal crusades to, to change that <laughs> language, right? Uh, because, first of all, that's so insulting to our humanity, right? Because it defines humanity by sin. And, and so I, I'm trying to introduce to our language for us to say in those moments, well, they're only a fallen human. Right? Because our humanity is beautiful. It's resplendent. It's made in God's own image. So we cannot allow our humanity to be defined by sin. Now, sin is the thief. Sin is the liar. Sin is the one who deprives and, 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 and robs the richness of our being from us. So you know, our humanity, and we see here, especially before the fall, was beautiful. And the relationship in the world God wanted for us. And I think that by knowing that, we began to see, first of all, what sin stole from us. And then what Jesus Christ was seeking to restore to us, and then infinitely more in his passion, death, and resurrection. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, I think that's so important, right? It sounds silly to say because as you say those things, well, of course it's important to know. But we don't, I mean, how often do we hear these things? I don't think that often, right? But how important is that? Yes, yes. And, 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 and as you mentioned the story in the book, like I, I remember as a seminarian sitting at the, the lunch table, this eminent theologian, uh, and, and I want to be respectful, I don't mention the person's name, and who completely dismissed it. Now, in, in the book, I give scripture citations and citations from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. They are throughout the book. In order for people to understand, this is not my personal opinion or my personal interpretation of the scriptures. This is not one school of spiritual theology. And so, no, these are the doctrinal teachings of the church here very clearly. And this theologian was completely dismissive. That's not the language we need today. That's not very helpful to the work of the church. And almost condescending. It's like, well, wait a minute. These are the teachings of the church. <laughs> I mean, if we don't get the first part right, then we're kind of on a trajectory of getting everything else wrong, right? And, and I think in, in a lot of ways, like we, as we said before, we, we don't find this in popular teaching. We don't see it in teaching. We don't find it in, in, in published works. And some of that is is a, is intentional. Like, but there are some theologians who find it, as I was told at that lunch table, unhelpful to the work of the church. And for the life of me, I don't understand what they're talking about because, in my own studies of the of our original inheritance, what, what theology calls protology, so this early part of of salvation history, in my own studies for it, it was eye opening. It's like now I get it. Like. Okay, it was almost like, like biblically, you know, scales falling from my eyes. It's like I could see the redemption of our Lord in a whole different light and perspective that I could not see or understand before. Yeah, because you you know what you are being redeemed towards, or 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 or, or, or two, right? And that, I think it's very important. <laughs> yes, amen. Amen. So talk to me then about the fall. Now this is, I'm curious because again, this is the idea of going back to the, the, the whole kind of uh, organization of this book, that things are important to know so we can live this life and understand our, our, our place in it, right? And we yes. have original inheritance, then we have the fall. And the fall again is one of these things that I don't think is, is, is spoken of very often or understood very often. And for me, this is one of those things, kind of like suffering, honestly, that pushes people away from the church sometimes because they misunderstand this or they encounter this idea in in you know popular culture somewhere and go that doesn't sit right with me like in the same way that why has God a lot of suffering and if you have no good answer for for that it's one of those things that we know causes people to fall away from from the church this too for me I have in my own life encountered a lot of people who these days look at the fall and go 
well, how does the fall fit in with a just God? How would he let two people ruin, ruin it for everybody? How would he let two people allow evil to enter into the world? And, and you know, some pretty seriously, sometimes very, very devoid of, 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 of death, but oftentimes kind of deep, deep reactions to the idea of, of the fall and no good answers. And that kind of pushes them away from the church. So thinking again about understanding our inheritance, understanding where we're, where we've been so we know where we're going and can and see ourselves in, in this proper Catholic life. How would we explain the fall from a Catholic point of view in a way that that makes sense of our inheritance and God being a just God and and these mm-hmm. kinds of things? Yes, yeah, so, just to show you the, the importance of, of the question you're asking, which, which I would hope would be in the heart of, of every Christian that you know, wants their faith to seek understanding. Uh, Pope St. John Paul II said that it is original sin, so the understanding of original sin, that is the hermeneutic, so the interpretive key to understanding the whole of the Christian message. Yeah, wow. So if we don't get this original sin, if we don't have a full grasp, biblically and theologically, of what original sin is, then we cannot understand the whole of the Christian message. So in terms of understanding original sin, if, if we go back to that beauty and the nobility of our nature that, that God bestowed upon us at, at the beginning of creation. And, and sometimes I like to highlight you know, that part, that, that first inheritance, because of the emphasis on the nobility and the beauty. So we can begin to appreciate our human nature uh, without sin, right? So, so how God created it, right? And, and in part, just to understand that in itself, but then also as that move then to original sin, we can begin to realize what we lost what sin stole from us at our invitation. Right? So in the book, I give the example of, you can imagine this beautiful and resplendent temple, just powerful and, and, and awe-inspiring and, and just ornate and, and majestic and so on, beautiful, beautiful temple. Right? And you can imagine a person who walks into that temple with a grenade and then allows the grenade to go off and, and the grenade explodes and the walls of the temple hold the, the blast, but everything inside the temple is thrown into complete chaos, complete disarray, and nothing is where it's supposed to be, and the order is completely off now, and, and everything is just, is just disoriented, right? Well, if we can understand that, if that imagery kind of resonates with us, that's what original sin did to our, our nature and to creation. So we brought in that grenade into the temple, so creation, our human nature, that was built for the worship of God. And we allowed this grenade to go off, and it has thrown everything off. The preternatural gifts are completely scattered. Sanctifying grace is lost. Creation now is at odds with us. We're in domination against creation. We're in battles with our neighbors rather than seeking harmony with one another. The whole of creation, our human nature, just has this complete disorientation, this fallenness to it. And that is the nature of sin. So St. Paul would summarize it all by simply saying in his letter to the Romans, the wages, that's the cost, the wages of sin is death. And of course, this is not simply um, a physical death, which of course is is part of the the consequences of of the fall, but a death in every other area, a death of the harmony within our soul, a death of tranquility with creation, the death, it just, sin robbed and stole everything And we're left with this temple now that is still intact, still standing. Our nature is still good, right? (laughs) But yet fallen and wounded as everything is in disarray. And that's what sin does. And so our first parents, because they were not simply our first parents, but also we can say the prototypes of our human nature. When they fell, it was not simply their personal sin, but the sin of our human nature, which is why it's been passed to us. And we all share as human beings with the same nature, in this woundedness, this this uh, disarrayed temple within our souls uh, to this day. Yeah, I think that that's very well said, Father. One of the things that I encountered that felt different to me about Catholicism when I was looking into the church is we, we talked a lot of, in, in my strand of evangelical Christianity, and this is different depending on where you come from, whether a Calvinist background or, or, what, or, or whatnot, but how we talked about humans was humans were by their nature these horrible broken fallen beings you already pushed back against that a little bit earlier but how are we meant to describe 
you know, ourselves understand our story as these kind of fallen creatures now, but with this inheritance of these wonderful good things, uh, how do we frame? Because I, I, you know, that's where I came from. This idea, I read the catechism, and it seems like we're not meant to be these horrible, miserable sinners as our identity, despite being being fallen. So, how do you frame for us to understand who we are as Catholics? How do you how do you frame that? How do you would you put that, Father? Yes, yes, I, I would say that. You know, a lang- uh, some language that we would definitely avoid is that our, our nature has now somehow become corrupt, right? Or it, it is you know, um, you know completely you know broken or, or destroyed. Uh, you know, and, and the example I gave you know the, the, the walls of the temple have held the blast, right? So our nature is a gift from God; it is good, and that goodness cannot be stripped by us. Okay? That is something that is a is a gift, the benevolence of God. And so it cannot be taken. So we would certainly say as Catholics that our nature is wounded. We could even say, following the tradition of St. Augustine, that it is deeply wounded. But we would definitely avoid saying that it is corrupt. And and sometimes in in Protestant uh, classical theologies, we would find this language used, that nature is corrupt, it's it's completely gone, and so on. And and we would not say that because we emphasize that our nature as, as creation, it was a gift from God. So we'd say that we, we, we cannot rob this gift of its inherent goodness, right? We just can't. We can deprive ourselves of sharing in that goodness, but this is a gift given. So, so we would definitely say wounded, in, in some cases deeply wounded, but we would, we would definitely avoid saying that it's you know, deprived or, or you know, completely gone, right? And, and that also helps in terms of our theological language, because you can understand we speak about that our nature is redeemed, right? Well, how can you redeem something that's completely, you know, gone? That's yeah. completely, you know, you know, destroyed. But you redeem what's still good. So, you know, the Lord again, following the Catechism of the Catholic Church, everything He said, did, and suffered was to restore us to our original vocation. So that vocation was something we abandoned, but God did it. <laughs> you know, what I mean? God is ever faithful. I mean, yeah, as a moral theologian, one of the things I constantly emphasize in, in this context and in every other one that the story of our lives, the story of salvation, is not whether or not God will love us. God's love is unconditional, everlasting. It's whether we will allow ourselves and put ourselves in the arena where we can accept that love and then spend our lives reciprocating that love to God and to our neighbor in our love for God. That's the story of salvation. God's love is not conditional. Right? And, and I think sometimes it's a consequence of the fall that we start to think in this way. You know, Pope St. John Paul II emphasized that point. He also said that you know, in our fallenness, we constantly want to make God master, and we want to make ourselves slave. God is constantly shouting out that he wants to be father, and he wants us to be his children. That's the paradigm that God wants. We keep inversing that and breaking it and say, no, 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 you're going to be the master, and we're going to be the slaves. And God is like, that is not the relationship I want with you. But again, this is our fallenness, our sinfulness, our rejection of what God is offering, but the gift is still good, and the gift is held by God. It, it cannot be deprived of its goodness. We don't have that power to, to, to rob our ne- our nature of its inherent goodness. Yeah. I think that's so fantastic. That Well said, Father. I'm thinking of a, a, a strange experience that I had myself. I, I told the story before on the, the podcast a few times, but when I first had this conversion experience as a 15-year-old, 14-year-old evangelical, well, nothing at the time, but I became an evangelical Christian at the age of, say, 14. I was, I was saved, we would say. I had this bizarre experience of once I realized that I think God was out there and I think I wanted to know him, I had this weird inclination to, to pray as I best knew how to pray. God, I'm not worthy, but if you're there and can accept me and love me, I want to know you. And I still to this day don't know where that weird inclination came from. I don't. I didn't have that language in my vocabulary. I wasn't raised Christian. I wasn't raised with that kind of vocabulary or understanding of, of anything. But I had this weird inclination that I wasn't worthy t- to know God unless he thought I, I was. It was this really strange inclination. But I think of that often when I think of the idea of our fallen nature and our original inheritance in these things, you know, how God wanted things to be versus how they were. I think of how weird that was, for one thing, for me to think that. And I think of it as some kind of weird moment of infused grace in my life that God allowed me to see a small bit of 
of his plan for salvation. But it really, for me, harkens back to the idea of, of really who we are in our identity and how to understand that. And, and gosh, that, that if I had known how much God wanted to give me that gift and how ready he was to say, yeah, I want to be your father in that moment. You know, I did, I did on, my knees, on my knees cry in that moment, Father, but I think I would have been weeping for days if I had understood the, the weight of that, right? Uh, yeah, so, so, and then, you know, it, I'm always inspired, St. Paul, also in his letter to the Romans, he, he says kind of bluntly that we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit prays through us. And and the, the experience you're describing, it, it's, blatantly, it's the Holy Spirit yeah, is yeah. praying through you and, 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 and you know, helping you to see and understand uh, in, in some form like what, what God was seeking to do. And, and just imagine as we grow in the spiritual life, as we grow in our discipleship, we begin to understand that how much he does love us and the relationship that he does desire to have for us. And, and, and again, that constant sense of, wow, we're, we're just not worthy of this. And yet it's precisely by acknowledging that we're not worthy, that suddenly we begin in that gratitude to draw closer to him and begin to realize that he is the one who has saved us. He is the one who desires to father us. He is the one who wants us to be with him forever. And, and so as you described that, I, I, I think that I pray that every believer who's, who's listening you know, can also in their own discipleship count those one or two moments or more, hopefully, where definitely the Spirit was praying through them, where there was a language or, 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 or an understanding that we could not at the moment or, or even you know, afterwards fully describe. How did that happen? And yet to watch it after those powerful moments of conversion, then the Spirit comes in that gradual transformation that He brings about by His grace. We begin to realize fully what had happened in that moment uh, of that conversion and to begin to realize what, what God desires from us and what he wants to offer to us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about redemption in light of the, the fall of our first parents. I mean, this again is is so important to to understand, right? You begin with, you begin with us talking about creation, the, the beginning, our original inheritance, and then this fall. And now we begin to unpack and, and, and live out a life that understands that redemption then. What should we understand? And this is, of course, we could unpack this for, for years. And you could have written hundreds of pages on this if you had chosen to, I think. This is a huge topic. But starting in a small way here, talk about what do we understand or should understand about our redemption, what that, that means in light of the fall, in, in light of that, the, you know, what, what we received from our first parents, that, that, the, the nature that, that turned Turn from God. Thank you. And, and, and as you're describing, as, you're, as you're asking this question, I'm, I'm getting fired up over here. <laughs> in, in so many, you know, so many respects, like you know, as we talk about first inheritance and the fall, they both point us in, they push us uh, to this question now, this this uh, act of redemption by by the Lord Jesus. And, and and I will say, just by understanding now these movements we've described, the original inheritance, the fall, and then the redemption. Now, with that background. Any Christian can read St. Paul's letter to the Romans and have a broader understanding of what he's trying to do as he describes and juxtaposes Adam with the Lord Jesus and so on. Now we can begin to understand, as, as Paul is, of course, a, a trained rabbi, probably one of the most educated uh, Roman Jews of his day, and, and he's now describing, now we can understand what he's trying to work out in portions of, of the letter to the Romans. So, so if we, we dive into the reality of, of, of the redemption, uh, let's just go back, you know, to to the fall. So we had this first inheritance, there's the fall, and and God comes and as a good father, He allows discipline uh, to to come to His children in order for us to understand that what we do is wrong and that we are called to this life of goodness, to, to holiness. And and in the midst of this discipline, He gives us a promise. So you know, Gen- Genesis chapter three verse fifteen, uh, it's called in our tradition the Proto Evangelium. The Catechism of the Catholic Church develops this and explains this proto-evangelium. It just means first gospel. So even the language theologically indicates to us that something is happening. This promise is going to then point us to the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ. So the proto-evangelium, and what it tells us is that a woman will come and her offspring will crush the head of the serpent that has done this, but he will strike at the heel of the son. Right? Okay, so... Now, that opens up all kinds of things in terms of, here's the first prophecy, the first promise of a Savior. So there's got to be a woman. So oftentimes when people want to dismiss Our Lady, it's like, well, wait a minute. If there's no Mary, then Jesus of Nazareth cannot be the Messiah, right? 
because there must be a woman and her offspring comes is going to crush the head of the serpent. Right? Now, we forget, though, the second part of that, that the serpent is going to strike at his heel. So the Messiah, the anointed Savior, will be victor, but he will be a wounded victor. And I think that's very important for us to understand what's happening. Now, all throughout salvation history, in fact, the whole of the Old Testament is God molding and shaping and forming us in order to receive this anointed Savior. And I think that we have to, in our minds, try to understand that, because it can be hard for us in the Christian age to go back and to try to understand that messianic longing. You know, when is the Messiah going to come? When is the anointed Savior going to come? Is it, will it be now? Will it be in the age of our children? Like, when is this going to happen? And, and this waiting and this waiting. And then, of course, you know, King David comes. Everybody thinks it's going to be David. Like, this must be him, right? Like, Israel has never been so great. And, 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 and David is not the Messiah, right? And, and then we, we have this, you know, post-Davidic time, this, this time of hardship and, and the second temple and so on. And, and this kind of longing and longing and longing that, you know, Prophet Isaiah, especially in you know, the, the mid-portion of, of, of his writings, he, just, he has this, this longing of the Hebrew heart, you know, when is he going to come? When, when is the Messiah going to, to, to arrive? And, and when will uh, these enemies be vanquished? Right? Well, it's important for us just to be, get in that mindset because when the Messiah did come in the fullness of time, God sent his son. Now, we, we've got to try to get back to that so we can understand the awe and the power of that. Wait a minute. We've been waiting for a Messiah, someone like David, right? We could never have anticipated. Isaiah, in all of his prophecy, could never have imagined that it would, in fact, be God himself <laughs> who would be the Messiah. Right? God himself would be the anointed Savior. God will come and take on a human nature, and God himself will fulfill the work of redemption. That everything that was lost, God the Son will be sent out of love for the Father and love for us, his siblings, his brothers and sisters in order to bring forth the work of redemption through the path of suffering. And I just think that the reality of being redeemed and taken back to that original vocation, attend the realization that the one who's doing this, the Redeemer, isn't a David or an Abraham, that it's God himself who has come to us on a rescue mission in order to fulfill the promise he made to his parents. And that just both moves me emotionally and, and inspires me and just understand how much God loves us and, and that when he makes this promise, how faithful he is and how much he wants us to understand that sin has no power over us, that sin and death have been destroyed, and that we are once again invited into his fellowship and his family. So that's the work of redemption. Like, and, and sometimes we speak about these truths in such a passing or dismissive way, and, 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 and it really grieves me that sometimes at Christmas, we're, we're more worried about Santa Claus and reindeers and snowmen than the fact that the Messiah has come, right, you know, in the fullness of time. And, and I just think as Christians, we have to retrieve this awe and this splendor and this power and this just joy, the fact that God has come as Messiah, that he has redeemed us, he has saved us, his people, he's called us back to himself. Do, do you worry about snowmen, Father? <laughs> I mean, not South Carolina. We've heard about these strange snowmen from you know, other parts of the world. You know? so. <laughs> oh, I take your point. I think listeners will as well. I just picture this army of snowmen approaching, actually, and that's what we're worrying about. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's fantastic. And I'm, I'm thinking, as you're saying that, I'm thinking of... Of, of Christ crucified. I'm thinking of the, 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 the crucifix that is in so many, well, is in every, should be in every Catholic church around the world everywhere, and how striking that image is in, in light of, as you describe it, right, the Messiah that the, the Jewish people were waiting for, and here he comes, and it is it, it's God himself. So, of course, looking on that crucifix is so much more, Gosh, you say moves you emotionally and, and like, you know, theologically, but yeah, I think so. When you look in that crucifix and think, yeah, God himself came down and that's, that's him there suffering. Didn't send an, an, an agent or, or just some holy man to be the Messiah. He himself came and, and like that, that for me transforms the idea of looking on the cross and what I'm getting out of that now. And I, when I think about that in, in yeah. those terms, Father. And, and I would say, you know, the, our emotions are our gifts from God, and, and, and our emotions complement with truth. Like that's where our emotions are powerful, because they help us just to actualize, you know, 
fully experience you know, these divine truths. And and just to show like the, the radicalness of this, that the early church, I mean, the two predominant heresies, Arianism and Docetism, could not fully grasp or accept this reality. Arianism saying, well, he's not really God, he's kind of like a superman, or Docetism saying, well, he wasn't really a human being, he was, you know, maybe a, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, maybe he was kind of like a Superman as well, or, or maybe a, a theophanized angel or something, and, and so on. Because the reality of this, that wait a minute, this long-awaited Messiah would back to God, that God would become a human being, uh, it blew their minds to the point of disbelief. And I wanted to move us in such a way we can understand the tremendous passion and love that God has for each one of us. That once we were ready in the fullness of time, He came Himself in order to be the dealer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, we, we don't have we don't have forever to talk on, on this episode, and I, we could talk for a long time on, on these topics, and the next one's a bit of a big one, so we got to truncate it a little bit. It's the idea of grace, and I think the the importance of grace in this whole process, the understanding our place in the spiritual story, grace is really important. For us as Catholics, the, the primary means of receiving grace is the sacrament, which is a weird thing to explain and unpack for a non-Catholic Christian where that idea of sacrament is kind of foreign. But you do a great job in this book. And you also talk about the idea of actual grace and give some yes. examples of that too. So can we just contrast these two things a little bit? Not really maybe a contrast, but explain these two things a little bit and, yes. and how grace works. Because of course, we, we can't do this, this ascetical spiritual life. We can't understand how we're meant to live doing it on our own, like pulling up our own bootstraps. That's not the intention of, of the, the Catholic life. It's, it's through grace. So how does that work in the life of, of a Catholic? Yes, and I'll tell you, if, if we can retrieve the notion of grace in the life of the church and in and catechetics and theology, I think we've done, we will have done a great work for the gospel because it, it's almost completely gone. If we talk about how no one speaks about their first inheritance, no one really speaks about grace in terms of, of this power, this, the, the life, this, the, the, the power of God dwelling within us. Uh, in many places, become completely psychologized or yeah, it's yeah. been relativized into some type of, uh, you know, uh, divine pep talk or, you know, uh, you know, these kind of warm fuzzies or, or whatever it might be. Um, but no, like grace is like uh, biblically understood and, and, and seen in our theological tradition. The life. And the power of God that dwells within us. And, and there are different levels of grace. And, and when we use these terms theologically, it's not that suddenly there's more God here or more God there. It, it's a reference actually to our souls, like how much grace, how much of the presence of God are we accepting, receiving? Or what is that grace doing within our souls? When we use these different terms, it's more what we are receiving or how we're receiving it rather than, again, the fact that there's less or more God or something like that. So, so just to, to clarify, that, that's some. Sometimes there's that misunderstanding. So uh, due to the two types of grace, I think we want to focus on, and there are many other uh, terms used in our theological tradition, but the two is sanctifying grace, and, and I should mention uh, actual grace. Sanctifying grace, that's what makes us his children. So that's what our first parents had. We lost that in the fall. It was, we're not, it was not restored until the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It can only be received through the sacraments. So sanctifying grace, it's also called deifying grace or habitual grace, not in the sense of habit, but in the sense of habitation, so dwelling, because it's God's presence dwelling within us. So the sanctifying grace, God is within us. He takes his residence up. He dwells within our souls. Okay, that's sanctifying grace. It comes to the sacraments. But then there's actual grace. And this is the part that gets kind of interesting, because you really see the dynamism and the creativity of God, because actual grace is acted upon us. So it's a spontaneous movement upon us. So sanctifying grace dwells within us. Actual grace acts upon us. So I give the example, uh, a husband's driving home from work, and he sees there's a sale on flowers and says, oh, I should bring my wife flowers home today, right? That's actual grace. That's the Holy Spirit saying, hey, show love for your wife. Get those flowers, right? So it's actual grace. So there's actual graces all the time that are moving. Do this. Don't do that. Go there. Don't go there. Say this. Don't say that. Actual grace. Like So you know, the little flower St. Therese would say, you know, all is grace, right? And this is what she's talking about in that God is constantly moving and shaping us and directing us and, and warning us what to do, what not to do, and so on. So it's, of course, the Holy Spirit who's working and it's giving these actual graces and so on. And I'll tell you, once we begin to understand that, that our world is not just the fallen world, 
but the world that's being redeemed and specifically being redeemed through God's children, that these actual graces are constantly working. And you start to see it in that perspective. And then we say, well, every time I respond to grace, there's more grace being given. There's more actual grace. Right? And then suddenly I'm in situations where I'm doing or saying things that I don't even understand what it means to another person, but then suddenly they are sharing that that was exactly what I needed to hear, or that's exactly the response I needed, or you're exactly in the place where I needed you, and so on, because we begin more and more to cooperate with God's providence, and he can begin to place us in positions where we can truly be salt, light, and leaven, so we can begin to fulfill our vocation. So this actual grace is constant work within us. I'll tell you one area where actual grace is very important, and I get this a lot sometimes in the spiritual life. When people are seeking to draw closer to God, they're trying to live this asceticism, and so on. And so what happens if I've committed a grave sin, I can't receive Holy Communion, and, and, and so on. And they say, why don't I still go to Mass? And if you don't understand the different workings of grace, it, it can kind of be a perplexing question. But if you understand actual grace, it's like, well, wait a minute. By going to the sacrifice of the Mass, even if you can't receive Holy Communion, you're receiving actual graces for conversion, Right? And when you then go and you continue to live your life, it's actual grace that either is given to you because of some action you're involved in or because of the spontaneous movement of the Holy Spirit. Or get this, the prayers and the sacrifices of others that are meriting actual grace. So it's actual grace. And the whole purpose of actual grace when we're outside of the relationship with God is to bring us back to that relationship with God. So I tell people, don't stop coming to church if you're in grave sin or, or you know, don't continue to commit grave sin because you think, well, what's the point? I'm lost anyway. Because no, the more grave sin you commit, the farther and farther you're away from God, the harder and harder your heart gets. And then actual grace becomes more difficult. So I think by understanding the work is a grace, I hope even by this small presentation, people begin to realize the dynamism and the creativity of God, that he's always moving and acting and, and trying to bring forth our best. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's almost that that pocket you can get into where you're living in just the right kind of place to just constantly be seeing these these graces from God. I think that's a that's a good sign that you're probably in a good place if you're constantly uh, aware of how God's moving. I can think of times in my life when uh, oftentimes when I was at my most despondent, like really suffering through something, but calling out and crying out to God and then seeing him in all these places, these, these little mercies, these little graces that were letting me know that I'm suffering through this thing, but here's God right alongside me, helping me in all these different small little ways that I was able to to respond to and see because I was really uh, uh, trying to abandon myself to, to his grace and his providence, right? And you, you begin to... Yeah, I think it snowballs. See all these these places where, where he's moving, right? Yes, and I think St. Paul describes that when he says we move from life according to the flesh, and, and the idiom the flesh means our fallenness. It's yeah. not a synonym for our bodies, right? So we move it from life according to the flesh to life according to the spirit. Yeah. Because when we start living by the spirit, we get us all over the place, <laughs> right? And we begin to see grace everywhere rather than sin. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, the last thing I want to touch on is is kind of the the end of of this book and what kind of wraps things up. And this is, you know, kind of w- w- where we're going uh, in a sense. And you mentioned it before; it's the purgative way. So I want to kind of unpack that for a bit. This, of course, could be an entire podcast just on this idea. And many of these these chapters could be the same thing. But talk about how we're, we're meant to understand this in order to rightly understand our, our place in the world. This idea of the of the purgative way. I think it's so powerful. Obviously, you do too because you wrote it. You wrote about it. And unpack this for us a little bit here, Father, as we as we end, you know, close off this this show. Yeah. So, so one person read the book and, and joked, and they said that I ended the book with the beginning, right? <laughs> in, in the sense that once we begin to understand these theological truths and the relationship that God wants with us, and, and the work that God has done in order for us to have this relationship with Him, and we begin to say yes. You know, at first, there are moments of great consolation powerful kinds of, we pray, we feel good, we pray, we see the results of our prayer. We do have those warm fuzzies, right? And, and everything just seems wonderful. And then at some point, and sometimes the spiritual masters say within about the third month of a conversion or a reconversion, all of those graces are taken away. All those consolations are, are gone. And instead, the graces of consolation are replaced with the graces of obedience. And we are in a spiritual darkness, a purgation, 
suddenly we, we don't want to pray. The, the thought of prayer is just repulsive to us. We question the existence of God. Is he, does he care about us? We, we see no results born from our prayer. We feel almost as if our prayer is making things worse and so on. And all these things just to begin to befall us. And yet, in the midst of that, there's a grace of obedience that's being given, which is, I'm not getting anything out of this. I feel completely empty, but I will continue to pray. Now, it is very important for the Christian to understand what's happening here, because that's oftentimes when people stop praying, because they think they've done something wrong, right? But no, spiritually, like the spiritual master tells, God is closer to us at that moment than in the times of consolation. So we can imagine that the time purgation is, is similar to you know, being under anesthesia, that you know, we don't feel anything, but the Holy Spirit is doing a lot of work internally, right? And the time of purgation is just a stripping of self-love because I don't get anything out of this. I don't feel anything. I'm perhaps even repulsed at the idea of this. And yet I'm still showing up because I love the Lord Jesus. I love God. Right? And that stripping is a uh, stripping of self-love, of egotism, of narcissism. The idea that somehow simply because I speak, God is bound to answer and so on. So suddenly in many respects, it puts us in our place to, to not only understand the love that God has for us, but then to more generously respond to it. And at the end, to be able to say, I follow God because I love him. <laughs> I expect nothing from him. Like if there's poverty or riches, health or illness, I don't care. Like I, I have a holy indifference to these things. I follow God because I love him, because he is the fulfillment of my every hope. He is the one who has loved me beyond all things. I choose to follow him. So the purgative way that that spiritual darkness is meant to serve that purpose. And by understanding that, we can then begin to respond, respond to grace, to seek spiritual helps, which I try to mention in the book. So spiritual reading or those set prayers that we spoke about earlier can be a part of it. But the important part is to persevere through the time of purgation because the purgation, that, that purgative way ends with an illumination. So there's some type of, of grace given to us uh, that is powerful. It, it, it's something we can think we knew and perhaps cognitively knew before, but suddenly it just existentially changes us by this illumination that's given. And then oftentimes after the illumination, we are taken back to the purgation. Right? So, and, it's, and it's this constant process of, of, of healing and so on. Uh, oftentimes the, the spiritual masters will say that for the person who's new to the Lord, uh, new to the ways of God, that the illumination at, at, at first will oftentimes revolve around mercy or hope. I think it's powerful that in fallen humanity, the two predominant gifts we find in the spiritual life in these, this moment of, of first illumination is either hope because they've lost all hope or mercy because they have allowed unforgiveness to weigh them down. So this is the exciting adventure that we are invited to as we seek to see the face of our Father in Jesus Christ. <laughs> exciting to suffer. I love that. It, it's, <laughs> it is. It is, though. And you know what? I, I so appreciate that you highlight the, the, the spiritual masters, as you call them, those that come before us that talk about these things, because this is the experience. This is the, the typical experience of, of the Christian. In the class that I teach for, for people becoming Catholic as adults, I always underscore this, that, guys, we're done here now, but you're going to suffer. And be ready for it when it comes, because this is the pattern that all the great spiritual masters fall into, and we should expect this to happen. And, you know, as you underscore, I think it's so beautiful that God is closer to us in that moment than in those moments of when, when we can obviously see and feel Him. And we do come out the other side of that. I can speak from my own experience. You can, I'm sure, for yourself, Father. And we have these great spiritual masters who, who show us that at the end, other end of that, how much do you grow and know as a result of that experience? That's when you know our faith is truly tested and and refined and firing and grows on the other side, right? That's the pattern we should expect. And I just think of how how else do we die to self than 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 that experience, right? That is really like kind of the I don't know, cherry on top is maybe the wrong way of putting it, but that's really like you know the 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 paramount way of dying to ourself is in, in that experience, right? Yes, yes, and I think it's it's ultimately the poverty of spirit that the first yeah. beatitude speaks of. You know that that you know, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. That we approach God and say, I I, I have empty hands. I I have nothing to to offer in this relationship. Uh, we just allow that kind of complete existential poverty to be acknowledged and to stand before God and say, I, I'm nothing. Uh, 
and, and yet to show up and, and, and to kind of you know, accept that, that what can be a harsh reality for us at first, that you know, this kind of spiritual uh, darkness, this purgation, as we realize the loneliness of our creaturehood, the fact that we have nothing to contribute, and yet God will call us to himself, and to realize, how can I think that God owed me anything? or that I would place conditions upon whether or not I would trust him or love him. And, and again, this purgative way just brings us closer and closer to God. We begin to understand this is the relationship he wants with us. And, and it is an adventure. There is suffering. Uh, but as you know, our saints have constantly told us, like, it's worth it. Yeah. <laughs> you know I mean? like, you know, it. It's worth it. Like, uh, you know, the, the glory that awaits us, that glory into glory, uh, is greater than any of the sufferings you might undergo. Oh, that's fantastic. Father, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. I want to thank you for your time. And I want to ask you, where do you want to point listeners to to learn more? Now, this book is fantastic. And I've got to say that for listeners and viewers, we just touched on some topics in here, but the way you structure each chapter, I think is fantastic. You go into kind of an application, into some further reading, and to really, I mean, this is meant to really dig into and help us to to grow. We didn't do the the exercise part, part of this book. We just talked more about the topics, but the format is, is fantastic and really meant to, to really be something to actually chew on and, and, and work through. So where can they go to to get this and where else can they go to f- to find things that you are doing and, and these kinds of things what, what do you want to point them towards father yeah so, so the, the book uh, glory and to glory is available through the publisher angelico press and then uh, through a local catholic bookstore or through amazon and then my website is frkirby.com uh, so i try to post various articles or resources and then i'm also on twitter at, at father kirby and uh, again on my on twitter feed i try to post articles or links to things that might be helpful to people I do think that, as you're mentioning, that it's so important that we continue to, to try to dive into and understand our faith. And, and each chapter, as, as you referenced, concludes with spiritual exercises or a you know, spiritual response to what we've just learned, as well as some recommendations for, for further study or, or growth. Because it's it's amazing. Once someone begins to really allow that conversion to take, you know, take root in their heart, it, we just want to know. We, we want to know the ways of God. We want to love Him. We, we, we want to look for creative ways to draw closer to Him. And I hope that this small book, Glory to Glory, can be a resource to help ignite that fire and to continue to keep the fire um, burning brightly. <laughs> well, tell you what, Father, there's, there's books that I get and I have to, because of time crunch, doing this every single week, in and out, uh, kind of kind of skim read through. I tried to skim read through yours, Father, and I wasn't able to. I, I just kept getting sucked into reading every single word as as it unfolded. So, so that for me is usually the sign of a good book when I'm not able to just read it at more of a surface level to get pull things out. I just had to read the whole thing. So thank oh, yeah. you. Awesome. <laughs> Come Holy Spirit. Yeah. So thank you, Father. I want to say God bless you and your ministry for the church and your priesthood in your writing these fantastic things. And uh, thank you for being here today once again on the show. It's always great to have you. Thank you so much. My Well, friends, thank you again for listening to this episode of The Cordial Catholic. Hopefully you enjoyed that fantastic discussion with Father Jeffrey Kirby, always a popular guest on the show, and I think for very good reasons. There's so much depth to this discussion. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Do let me know. Please send me an email at cordialcatholic at gmail.com and let me know how you thought of the show, what you like, what you didn't like, where you're listening from, why you're listening, what you want to hear on this podcast program it's for you guys so please do reach out let me know what you want more of on this show i know for me it was very edifying to receive all kinds of feedback from my conversation with father kirby on suffering back in episode 140 i'll link to that in the show notes great feedback on that episode so i want to hear what you guys think about this one let me know, please. CordialCatholic at gmail.com. Our website is thecordialcatholic.com for show notes and for links to articles I have written and am writing. Please do check that out. We're on social media on Instagram and on Twitter at Cordial Catholic. We're on YouTube at youtube.com slash thecordialcatholic and on Facebook at thecordialcatholic as well. Please do find us and follow us in all those different places and spread the word and tell your friends to help this thing keep on going. And hey, if you feel led to support this show, it's not my full-time job and your support helps me to be able to spend time doing this, head over to patreon.com slash 
slash cordial catholic or paypal.me slash cordial catholic to support this show patreon members are entered into automatically entered into draws every month for different free books and there's all kinds of other perks to get access to as well check that out there thanks for listening guys take care and god bless This podcast is brought to you in a special way by our co-producers, Gina, Aram, Suzanne, Ellie and Tom, Kelvin and Susan, and Stephen. Thanks for your support of the show.